fill-in host, Mike Adams, uh, sometimes known as the Health Ranger. And uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening. And I want to thank Alex for just calling in and giving us a really powerful segment on the NFL boycott. And just to quickly repeat what he said, and by the way, I apologize to Bob Chapman, who's on hold. Bob will bring you in in just a second. But the NFL boycott is on. So check out the articles on Infowars.com and PrisonPlanet.com. And all next week, Alex is going to be hammering this issue home and working with your help to get the NFL to overturn this latest example of government intrusion and total tyranny into the privacy of our physical bodies. It's getting crazy out there. Yes, it's happening. Now they're coming after us at the football games. Uh, Bob Chapman joins us now. And I know, Bob, Alex wanted to ask your opinion on these events. Uh, thank you for holding. I'm sorry to, to make you wait. And, Bob, I'm, I'm a great fan of yours. I listened to you on The Alex Jones Show. So uh, good to be with you today. Well, thank you very much. And it's good to be here. And I don't mind waiting at all because... It teaches me things, and uh, I want to learn things every day, even at this advanced stage of life. Well, what, what's your take on the NFL pat-down situation now and what this means for liberty in America? Well, I think the most important thing is getting the message out. And uh, second of all, what I would do, let's say I was a ticket uh, holder for the season, I would call them up and say, um, if you have that happen, if you allow that to happen, uh, I will be there with all my tickets on Monday morning, and you can give me my money back. <laughs> and I don't yeah. care if I ever go to a football game again. Yeah, very, very good I think advice. I will get to them because the revenue that they'd have to give up back is enormous. They would bankrupt every NFL team. Well, let me pose the same question to you that I posed to Alex when he called in. And by the way, just, just to remind listeners, Bob Chapman is from the international forecaster, uh, dot com. So be sure to check out that website as, as always. But Bob, do you think that NFL fans will go along with this by and large? Or do you think we're now looking at a new wave of people standing up and saying enough is enough? Let's stop this here. It's hard to say. You won't know until you get there, but we got to tell them that's what they got to do. Uh, but they really shouldn't attend. Let them play to an empty stadium and take your tickets in and get demand your money back because you're not going to be groped by a strange group of people sent from the government. <laughs> Trained by the government in special uh, uh, physical and, and verbal interrogation techniques. In fact, this ought to be interesting. Kind of makes you wonder how large is government going to get if they keep having to send tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of agents across the country to search people under different contexts. I mean, what does this mean about the growth of the dangerous growth of government, Bob? Well, actually, it goes uh, to, I would say, around 1936, 37 in Germany. And um, for those of you who were not aware of it, uh, you know who ate all Hitler is, I'm sure. But uh just recently, we had legislation which was passed by the House and the Senate, and it was for the extension of debt. But within that context, they said that they had to reduce the amount of money in the budget that was going to be used. And at the same time, S&P come in and said, well, uh, we're going to lower your rating because you're not cutting enough. And if by November you haven't cut Medicare and Social Security substantially, then we're going to lower your rating again. And, of course, Standard & Poor's is controlled by the banks and the brokerage firms on Wall Street. I know. Yeah, yeah. I was there for 30 years. And the other thing that they did, which pertains to this, is that they formed a committee of 12 that were going to do this cutting or increasing in taxation, whatever they were going to do. And they have every intention of keeping this committee in its place. And it's unconstitutional. Yeah, the Super Congress. Because when they come up with the information that they do in a law, they send it to the House and the Senate. 
Bob, stay Thanks with us. Data. We Sorry to interrupt. we got to go to a break here. Stay with us. We're going to return here after the break on The Alex Jones Show with Bob Chapman, the international forecaster, to discuss more about U.S. debt and the financial catastrophe across the EU happening today. Stay with Bob us. Bob Chapman from The International Forecaster. And Bob and I were just chatting off air about some of the things that we want to cover. Um, Bob, you talked about the overreaction of the government, uh, the Super Congress, and even the Enabling Act. Can you get into all that? we got a lot of territory to cover here. It, it, it only takes a second. And so what the, uh, this Super Congress, as it's called, can do is put together the law, and they send it to the House and Senate, and they cannot debate it. They can't amend it. They can't filibuster it. They vote up or down, and that's the end of it. So what this has done is take the House and the Senate out of the context. They don't do anything. They just stand there as rubber stamps, like zombies. And so the reason I brought this up is a, a parallel example of this TSA thing with groping people. Only here, they're groping your freedom. Because this whole thing is modeled after the 1933 Enabling Act with the National Socialist Party in Germany passed, which made Adolf Hitler a dictator. And with this panel, these 12 people, that's exactly what they intend to do. So we're going to have a dictator in a few years because we've allowed that kind of thing to go on in our government. Now, can you and explain... true? This this council of the super congress. How does this how does this make the dictatorship the dictator even more powerful? Is it because these selected members of Congress uh, are selected by the president or influenced by the president? How exactly does that work? Well, the two parties put up the six and six each, and from the House and the Senate, and of course, they're people who will lay down for anything. Yeah. And the, the president just says, okay, this is what you're going to do. And they go to the, the Congress and say, here's the bill. Either defeat it or pass it. Is and 90% of the people in Congress are paid off, so they do what they're told. Otherwise, they don't get reelected. Sure. And so all the garbage in the world can get passed. And let's say that they, they, uh, the president said, I want to collect everybody's guns. So they'll put a bill together. And they'll send it to the House and the Senate, and these meatheads will vote for it. And so they go around, and they'll kick everybody's door down and take their weapons. That's all it takes. Aren't there many examples of this in human history of uh, legislators? For example, in the, in the Roman Empire, the Roman Senate eventually became corrupted and just sort of rubber-stamped the, the, the dictatorship aims of the leaders. That's correct. And almost every civilization... Every dictatorial government has had the same problem and has ended up the same way. Not all of them, but most of them. And it's an evolutionary process of pure evil and not caring about people at all, as long as whoever was in power got their way. I mean, you know, in the latter stages in Rome in the 300s and the 400s, as soon as they had disruption, they had somebody come out and say, well, I'm going to buy the army so I can be dictator, which they did. Yeah. And then they'd go off, you know, the outskirts of Rome and fight off the barbarians. And sooner or later, the mercenaries, which is most of the Roman army, army at that time, said was, well, we don't want to do this anymore. I'm going home to Gaul or wherever they came from. And uh, and that's the way it's going to end up. But what's so frustrating uh, about... America, if, I'm sorry, go ahead. If, if America does not erect, elect Ron Paul and people like him in the next election, that's what they can expect. But these people are preempting that in TSA and in government in relation to the Super Congress. Same kind of overriding, overbearing, we're going to do what we want to do, even though it's unconstitutional. We don't care. There is no constitution. Right. That, that's what is so frustrating about this is that it seems like U.S. government is now on a track to tyranny. They're following a, a blueprint 
that other civilizations or, or other nations have followed on the road to tyranny. This is happening right in front of our, our eyes. The things that you have warned listeners about are coming true. The things that Alex has warned about are all coming true. Uh, even Alex says they openly admit what they're trying to do. It's, it's like a, a recipe book, a playbook, and they're just following it step by step. And yet most of the people out there are completely asleep at the wheel. They don't understand what's happening. They don't understand why the super Congress is such a threat to their freedoms. Do you think, Bob, that this is about to shift? Are we going to have a reawakening, a resurgence of freedom in America, or are we doomed to go down this path of tyranny a lot farther until uh, until things finally turn around. Well, I think it's up to the American public, and uh, there's no better place to start that than at the NFL football stadiums. And uh, if people say, "No, uh, I'm not going to go. Give me my money back." All the teams are going to go out of business. All the players are going to be out of a job, and everybody's going to be mad at the government. And if they try it at railway stations, well, people will stop traveling unless they absolutely have to. I mean, I won't get on a plane just like Jesse Ventura won't. I'm on every S list in the world. In fact, I don't even live in the United States because I think if I lived there, they'd kill me. Yeah. And I'm not used to suicide. <sighs> right, right. Well, I don't, I don't fly either for the same reasons. Uh, I, I... I think, gosh, if the TSA saw me in an airport, they'd probably plant cocaine in my bag and steal my iPad and still grope me just just for their own amusement. Um, so I, I stay away from airports for that reason. But, you know, wh why is it, Bob, that, that mainstream public and look, the NFL, the people that go to these these football games, sports fans, they perhaps don't realize that there was also something in the Roman Empire called bread and circuses, right? that sports were all a, a form of distraction so that you don't think about the really important things that are happening around you. I mean, are, are these the people that, that can stand up? I hope they are, but I, I'm not sure yet. I don't know. We're going to find out, but we got to tell them, all of them who are listening, tell the NFL if that's what they're going to do at the stadiums. I'm coming in with my tickets and I want my money back. And that's strong motivation for them to call the White House and say, hey, there is not going to be an NFL. And if you try it with the NBA, you get the same thing in the hockey league and so on. There you go. Yeah, that, that, that's the answer. Do you want to shift gears? You know, we uh, don't I'm have sorry. to have sports. <laughs> we don't yeah. have to have sports. It's entertainment. I mean, I play professional sports. I know what it's all about. Yeah. I look. I I don't even have time to watch sports, so I wouldn't have seen this news if it wasn't on Infowars. I mean, we. Prop, I don't know what your uh, personal viewing habits are on sports, but I don't even look. I'm so busy fighting for freedom and, and exposing the FDA and exposing vaccine dangers and so on. I I don't even have a, a spare minute to look at sports. But I hope that those who do are going to pay attention to this, uh, Bob. Can you comment on now, as we shift gears to the European Union, the financial catastrophe that is mounting there and the massive financial fallout that, that lays ahead of us here as the dominoes start to fall? Well, Mr. Ge Geithner, who is the Treasury Secretary, just went to uh, Wausau to the conference that they have there. And uh, yesterday... Uh, the United States and Japan and Great Britain, which is broke, and uh, and Switzerland, which just devalued their currencies for the first currency for the first time ever. And you should see the letters we're getting about people pulling all their assets out of Switzerland and Swiss francs. People are infuriated, and they shouldn't have done it, and they didn't have to do it. But anyway, they were told to do it, and they do what they're told by the Illuminists behind the scenes. So what they decided to do was contribute money, loan money, on a 45-day basis, not giving the total, but I'm, I'm told it's over a trillion dollars, uh, to European uh, financial uh, sectors such as banks and also the, uh, uh, the central banks of, of other countries uh, like Germany, et cetera. And in addition to that, what they didn't tell you is they're going to do another currency swap for $500 billion. And that's when several countries get together and they digitally tell you you have X amount of Swiss francs 
and you're going to give us X amount of dollars. And the reason for that is that they want to be able to use the dollars in commerce because what's happening is everybody is pulling their money out of the banks in Europe, particular, particularly dollar deposits. And there's a run on the banks in Europe right now, just like we had three years ago in the credit crisis. And the Fed again ran, came to the rescue and, dis, and <clears throat> provided trillions of dollars secretly. Right, right. And didn't tell us about it. The GAO under the, uh, the Dodd-Frank uh, Act uh, audited them. The, the audit's not finished. And they said that the Fed lent $16.1 trillion. What is a colossal sum of money. And when they were doing it, I knew it. And in my publication, I said, the figure is 13.8. Well, ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry. I missed it by a few trillion. <laughs> the point is this. I called it, and it was out of control, but even more than I thought it was. And so this is the stopgap method of trying to save the euro, the euro zone, which is 17 of the 27 countries, and being able to kick the can down the road Oh, probably for 45 days. Well, let me ask you about the timing on this. Half, maybe this two or three months. And that's it. They're going to have to do it over and over again, or the whole thing's going to collapse. So they're not fooling anybody. Bob, what, what's what's your assessment of, of your... the timing on this? Um, uh, uh, sorry to interrupt you there. But how, how sure. long do we have before the real fallout begins across Europe for this? You said kicking a can down the road 45 days or so. But also, the question is, when do we feel the European financial catastrophe in the United States? Is it immediate? Is there a lag time? I mean, why should listeners in the U.S. today be so concerned and rightly concerned with the analysis that you are offering about Europe and the timing there? Why does it matter here in the U.S.? Well, it looks like they're going to buy two or three months here. And so it's not going to be that quickly. And uh, what about Greece? Well, that'll depend upon what the German Bundestag does, and uh, which is the House of Representatives, and that will be on the 29th. And if they don't pass uh, the loan uh, approval uh, from the Bundesbank to the European Central Bank, then there won't be a deal. And that means the U.S. will have to step in again uh, via the Federal Reserve and help these help the European Central Bank come up with the funds to lend them. Now it's illegal for the lend them, but nobody's making an issue out of it because they don't have that authority. They can't create money and credit, even though they do illegally. <laughs> you see, there's no rules anymore. Right. Well, we see that everywhere. As far as the United States concerned, the major banks in New York, of which there's five, they have insured the debt of Greece for the banks in Europe in part of what they bought. And it's about $150 billion. They say it's 75, but it's double that. And because they lie about everything. And we can't tell because we can't see their books. And also the money market funds, pension funds, have been buying Greek and other paper to get the yield. The yield's over 100%. And so they're taking the risk. Well, if they're offside, you get another 150 billion more, and so you're offside 300 billion, and maybe more, and that's going to affect the lending institutions in the United States, which then means that the Federal Reserve will have to give them more money again. Now, what's the flip side of all this? It's very, very, very inflationary, and what instruments profit by inflation? Gold, silver. And commodities, and that's it. Yeah, where where is gold today, Bob? I haven't been tracking it this week. What's it up to? Well, I track it while I'm talking to you. <laughs> we're we're dealing with the outside month, which is December, in both gold and silver. And gold is up thirty two sixty, and silver's up one twenty nine, a bit off their highs on the day. And um, 
I said yesterday morning on my shows that I'm on, I do lots of them, uh, that uh, this was the turning point again. And I think that's the third time in a row I picked it within like three or four weeks. And we're going to run right back up again. And uh, this time uh, they used, as they did before, the, uh, the derivatives, options, and futures. But this time they also had some of the central banks in Europe leasing gold to gold bullion banks like J.P. Morgan Chase. How much? I don't know. Uh, the structure? I don't know. <coughs> when, why, why, why would they be leasing gold to J.P. Morgan so that J.P. Morgan can cover its obligations in physical gold? That could be. But more importantly, what Morgan normally does is immediately sells the gold into the market. And when they go to pay the lender back, let's say it's Portugal, uh, when they go to pay him back, they pay him in dollars. But Portugal still has the gold on their books as if they still had it, and that's approved by the IMF. So the whole thing is a scam. <laughs> but what they were doing, I think, was lending gold into the market, what it, which is tantamount to gold sales. <clears throat> right, okay. Um, now, by the way, we're, we're coming up on a break here in about a minute, and we're going to continue with you, Bob, here on, on the show. I want to ask you... Uh, Perhaps this is not the realm you normally comment on, but I, I really value your assessment and your opinion. I want to ask you about Al Gore and how now even environmental groups, <clears throat> excuse me, environmental groups are now saying that Al Gore is so polarizing that perhaps he is harming the the global warming um, uh, industry, you might say, or the, or the whole advocacy of that theory. So I'd like to ask your opinion uh, about Al Gore. We've got about a minute if you want to get into that, and then we'll continue on the other side. Go ahead, Bob. Um, Armin Hammer was the uh, person who really financed uh, Al, uh, Al Gore's father. And uh, after he died, the Russians uh, said that he was a communist spy starting in 1923. Uh, I knew Armin Hammer, and I knew he was a communist all those years. And so was an Al Gore's father and Al Gore. Now, today, in, in our realm today, there's so many different kinds of socialism. It All right, we've got to go to break here. Stay with us, though, Bob. Sorry to interrupt you. Stay with us. We'll be back with Bob Chapman from the International Forecaster with continued comments on Al Gore and the global warming movement, which is now perhaps rejecting Al Gore. This is the Alex Jones Show. Now, Bob Stay Chapman with continues with us in this segment. I want to mention, if you'd like a free copy of the International Forecaster, his publication, just call 1-800-686-2237. Again, that's 1-800-686-2237. And Bob, before the break, I wanted to chat with you about Al Gore uh, and how he's becoming a nuisance of sorts to the environmental movement itself. Now, I've always thought, gee, Al Gore... Well, I know he's a, a fake environmentalist because he won't speak out against GMOs, which is a huge environmental issue. But now even, I guess, some of his own friends are saying he's, he's not the right guy to lead their march of fraud. I don't, I don't know. What, what, continue with that, Bob. Where do, you, where do you think this is going? Well, I think he's torn between uh, the power trip and the fact that he's filthy rich. And he's also part of this uh, carbon trading operation. He owns part of it. And so that'll bring him uh, income if it continues uh, ad infinitum. Uh, this, this carbon is nothing but a way to tax people. And uh, I, I did a lot of uh, radio work on that uh, two to three years ago and helped expose what they were up to in this uh, uh, carbon scam that they've got going. But uh, Al Gore is passe. Uh, he's been uh, proven to be uh, a liar, essentially, and many other people uh, who are in, uh, hooked up with the movement, uh, particularly people who are connected to government or the Council on Foreign Relations or the Trilateral Commission of the Bilderberger Group. And in fact, uh, our, uh, the man who calls himself president of the United States either has or is in, in the process of going to Australia uh, to help the PM there, who is the lady, and uh, to try to 
get the people to accept carbon taxes. And, uh, you know, what is he doing doing that? I mean, there's more important things here in America. Well, I, well ex anyway, ex exactly. The I'm point is that he and others have crippled that whole movement and it's lost its validity. And I don't think they're going to get it back. Uh, they, they continue to pursue it because carbon taxes are the way that they want to tax everybody in the world. It's very important to them. They've been working on it for 30 years. Here, here are words from The Guardian itself, environment blog, where uh, these, these are folks in the environmental movement saying Al Gore is a hugely polarizing figure, particularly in his homeland. <laughs> That's an interesting uh, term there to use. Whatever he does or says, no matter how cogent or sensible they claim, will attract scorn and derision, they say, from those who just can't see past the man. Well, I think we see right through the man, actually. I, I think we know exactly what he's up to. But, Bob, I... Well, I think if you really want to find out, why don't you consult with his ex-wife? I'm sure she's <laughs> got plenty to say. Yeah, Bob, I want to thank you for joining us. We are out of time. Thank you so much. And folks, check out the internationalforecaster.com to see more from Bob Chapman.